Good morning, everyone. Let's start our worship with a song this morning. A wonderful song. Let's stand together if you're able. Today I'm going to read from a different Bible. And as I do the sermon today, you'll figure out why, but maybe I'll tell you ahead of time. It's called the Geneva Study Bible. Actually, this is the New Geneva Study Bible. And it was um, John Calvin who led the Reformation in Switzerland and had brought a study Bibles into being. So those of you who have study Bibles and benefit from those, John Calvin's the one who did the work to bring this into being. And the Geneva Bible is the Bible that he had put together. And since there have been new findings since his time, such as the Dead Sea Scrolls that have been discovered, uh, there have been additions to all the Bibles, not additions, but enhancements, changes based upon manuscripts that were found. So I'm going to be reading from this Bible today, and you'll hear in the sermon uh, why that is. We pick up on our readings in 1 Samuel, and we continue the portion with uh, Scripture where we had heard that Saul was rejected as king, and so um, David had become a part of living in the, the royal palace under Saul's tutelage. And so this is a pickup in the reading where Saul's at. Now, the printing in this Bible is smaller than the other Bibles, so be patient with me as I try to read. So this is uh, chapter 18, just verses 12 through 16. Okay. Now Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with him, but had departed from Saul. Therefore, Saul removed from his presence, him from his presence, and made him his captive over a thousand. And he went out and came in before the people. And David behaved wisely in all his ways, and the Lord was with him. Therefore, when Saul saw that he behaved very wisely, he was afraid of him. But all Israel and Judah loved David because he went out and came in before them. We continue now in the book of Acts, and we're at the end of a chapter in Acts, just as we're ending a chapter here in the life of the church with me as the pastor. So we're going to end chapter 11 with the passage, verses 19, and I'll just read through 26. We had been reading how the persecution had scattered the disciples of Jesus, starting with the deacons. And then at that point in time, a man named Saul was converted on the road to Damascus. And he has not yet begun his ministry, but he was converted. Then the other apostles, beginning with Peter, began to go out and preach the word of God among the different cities in, um, beyond Judea and Samaria. And the person to go out was Peter, and now another person is becoming part of that, and that's going to be Barnabas and Saul. And this is the beginning of their ministry together. Hear these words now in verses 19 through 26 in Acts 11. Now those who were scattered after the persecution that arose over Stephen, traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, preaching the word to no one but the Jews only. But some of them were men from Cyprus and Cyrene, who when they had come to Antioch, spoke to the Hellenist, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned to the Lord. Then news of these things came to the ear of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent out Barnabas to go as far as Antioch. When he came and had seen the grace of God, he was glad, 
and encourage them all with the purpose of heart that they should continue with the Lord. For he was a good man, full of the spirit and of faith, and a great many people were added to the Lord. Then Barnabas departed for Tarsus to seek Saul, and when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. So it was that for a whole year they assembled with the church and taught a great many people, and the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. The word of the Lord. So a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord when the word was spread by the men from Cyprus and Cyrene to Gentiles in Antioch. And in hearing the news in Jerusalem, they sent Barnabas to further encourage the people in Antioch. With so many to teach, Barnabas brought Saul there. As a result, disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. And you'll see in the slide before us, The bright red stars mark the places that are part of this passage. Cyrene, Phoenicia, by the way, is part of the top part of Israel, just above that, so that's not on the screen for you. But also Cyprus, Tarsus, where Saul was from, and Antioch. So you can see their locations and how far the people had come to preach the word. In Acts, the persecution that came was used for the good as a catalyst for further spreading the faith to other places. And you can see the large spans. Palestine, Jerusalem is down at the corner, a very small patch. Look how even before the mission work is starting, the word is spreading among the people. And it even will end up spreading very soon in Paul and Barnabas being together Um, into parts of Europe and beyond. Religious persecution is one of the reasons why the Puritans fled England to settle what came known as New England here in the 1600s. And we have been looking at the front of the bulletin. The word is, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea, Samaria to the ends of the earth. These are words that Jesus had told us 2,000 years ago before he ascended into heaven. The word began to spread in the Middle East to Europe and even to us here in North America in the states of New England. And the pilgrims who came, many people think that the Bible that was the one that was used in those days was the King James Version. The King James Version of the Bible was actually a political Bible written objecting to study Bibles and commentaries within. So it was not the King James Bible that the Puritans, the pilgrims, would have brought with them. The word that they would have brought would have been the Geneva Bible because they came from a Reformed faith. So when the people came, many came to escape religious persecution, bringing their Bibles and the word of God with them, setting up new churches in the area. But they also came because they had heard about fertile land for agriculture and a nation loaded with resources. So some had come not for reasons of religion, but for reasons of wealth. And then the riches of the kingdom of God were put behind And the people began to turn away and forget about their original reasons for coming from the religious persecution. And the teachings and the Bibles were set aside. I mean, how many of you have a Geneva Bible at home? Most of you didn't even know it existed, but it was there. So throughout the Bible, faith also cycled. It ebbed and flowed in and out as people moved away from God and back again. This happened throughout the Old Testament and New. There are also periods in the United States of America where people move close to God and away from him again. After the times of the pilgrims settling, there were three periods of, in history that are referred to as spiritual revivals or great awakenings. 
And each of these revival periods were actually led by Presbyterian pastors. Who would have thought? Presbyterian pastors speech, speaking on spiritual revival and leading people and understanding the Holy Spirit. Jonathan Edwards, who lived from 1703 to 1758, was part of the First Great Awakening. I believe it was in Connecticut, was the main place where he had done a lot of his work in Massachusetts and those areas of New England, closer to the, the coastline. And the Great Awakening went from 30 to 43. But again, the people had forgotten, and within a hundred years, there was another Presbyterian pastor who began to lead a second Great Awakening. His name was Charles Finney. He had come from 1830 to 1831 at a high point of his revival being here in Rochester, New York. Anyone know that? And that's a good thing. Charles Finney's school is nearby. That Great Awakening ran from the 1800s to 1800 to 40. In fact, Menden Church gained its time of becoming a church within the period of the Second Great Awakening. Menden Church was part of this. And the revival had happened in the area when the Holy Spirit was being taught and moved. Rochester, I have learned as I've studied, um, is considered, and I thank John Thomason because he's a good historian. He had known some of these things and given me some information ahead of time. Another friend of mine, Kim Krogh, has done the same thing. It was known as the gateway to the West. Just as the people from New England began to go westward, many settled in Rochester because of the strong moving waters and ways that mills could have been founded and therefore was known as F-L-O-U-R, not today where it's F-L-O-W-E-R, the flower city. It was known to be a place where you can make a living for your families and so people had settled here. But they would also pass through Rochester to head to the west. But in time, just as the first great awakening, fire of the Holy Spirit, fizzled, so it was in the second great awakening, and Rochester gained an awful reputation being called the Burnt Over District, where the fire of the Holy Spirit was quickly put out. What a sad reputation to have. But it doesn't mean it needs to last. And also, we're not the only ones who see such a thing happening. Antioch itself, where people were called Christians first. This is in Syria. We know what's going on there. People think, oh, it's not a Christian country and there aren't Christians there, but the Christians are being persecuted and are in danger. And so the place that where people were called Christians first is now taken over in an area where there's much violence. This week in the U.S. Um, journal news, there was a story of a family who went to seek safety in the United States, one of 10,000 refugees in Syria. And these refugees come to the United States to seek light in the midst of the darkness that they face there. Are we really a place of light? Is Rochester to be a place of light. Well, according to Charles Finney and the work that he had done, it was established just like Syria, Antioch, where the people were called Christians first. Rochester was established, consecrated to God as a place of light. I heard that in 2010, there was a word for Menden Church to become a lighthouse. I've since learned in meeting people in the area, the PNC asked me, will you work with other churches? Will you work with other denominations? And I began to talk to pastors from all different kinds of churches and non-denominations. And I learned that in the last 15 years, so just a bit after 2010, there have been those who have seen similar visions of light coming from the area of Menden and a circle around the Rochester area. There's a church in Irondequoit where the people have been praying for years and have seen this light encompassing the Rochester area, and it looks like this. 
The light is a circle with Menden in the center. It extends down to Corning and even beyond, maybe even partly into the northern part of Pennsylvania, over to Buffalo and also to the Niagara Falls and the western edges of New York. Um, Eastwise, it's to Syracuse or perhaps a little bit beyond. And then if it's a complete circle, if it's a, a not an oval of sorts, it would extend into the Great Lakes. But this is what the circle is that a number of people that I have been in conversation with through years, from 2010 through 2011, have been seeing over Rochester. So since coming here, I've learned that there have been other pastors who are praying for revival in the Rochester area for people to come to Christ. I've heard some have been praying for two years, others for 10, some for 12, some for 15 church, but the win 15 years, but the one who wins the award is one who I hear has been praying for 30 years. If you think this doesn't belong to us, it has nothing to do with us, it's not affiliated with the church, you might be surprised to find who that person is. That person is Barb Sheeler, the daughter-in-law of Art Sheeler, the wife of Wayne Sheeler, the person that we have been praying for in the cancer that he has. Barb told me that she has been praying for revival in the area and for Menden Church since 1986. That's a lot of time. And so I wonder if Barb and others' prayers have been heard. So with revival, people coming to Christ in mind on June the 4th, I, along with another clergy member and two lead, lady, leaders, met for prayer. And as a result of that prayer, we decided that there's probably others praying. And as I've told you, we found out there indeed were. And that we were going to invite them to come to monthly prayer with us for the purpose of revival. In other words, we hope that the greater Rochester area, as in Antioch, there would be a great number of people who would believe and turn to the Lord. If you want to know if the Lord had this in mind, and if the Lord has blessed this, you can often tell by the rapidity, the rapidness of growth. Well, let me tell you what happened next. By mid-August, actually it was within a month that we had reached the first number, but now it's over 40. Within a month, and by mid-August, the number of people meeting for prayer grew from 4 to 20. The mailing list grew from 4 to 40. The number of churches represented in the group of prayer grew six times, from 3 to 18 churches, along with individuals and parachurch organizations. Seven of the 18 churches, if you're thinking this does not fit our theology, and our background are specifically Presbyterian, different kinds of Presbyterian churches, but Presbyterian churches. Attendees, if you look at the circle, come all the way from Corning, Buffalo, and Arondequoit. People on the mailing list are all the way to Syracuse, and there are many in between. Now the involvement is still growing and beyond 40 people. So how does the scripture and how does news of revival in Antioch and revival in Menden apply to the congregation of Menden? That's up to you. There's a growing handful of those who are or have been associated with Menden Church who are part of the group to pray and pray for revival. They want to see a great number of people come to believe and turn to the Lord. But I can't answer what the role is here. That answer is one that you have to make for yourselves. The question is, the next slide asks, do you desire for people to come to Christ? That's the big overarching question. Is the yearning for revival a part of your prayer life? Do you hunger to make it so? Does the scripture today have a relevance for you and for Menden Church? 
That is not a question that anyone can answer for you, certainly not one that I can answer. The question is one that every individual must answer individually. And all of us answer to Jesus who said, You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. We are to go where he sends us to witness to him. I am to go where he sends me to witness. You are to go where he sends you to witness to the very ends of the earth. We are to go where he sends us to witness for people to come to Christ. That's why we come here on Sunday mornings. That's why we go from here to where he sends us. Wherever he sends us, we are to witness to Christ and to be a light to the world. Amen.